Sustainable Connections, a podcast connecting ambition to action, is brought to you by ERM, the world's largest peer play sustainability consultancy. In this podcast, host Mark Lee, director of the Sustainability Institute by ERM, speaks with some of the most innovative and boundary pushing minds in the field, examining the connections necessary to make sustainable business a reality across sectors and systems and up and down organizations. Topics cover the breadth of the sustainability agenda, including net zero, nature positive, biodiversity, equity, resources and frameworks, and more. This is Sustainable Connections. Welcome, everyone, to this next episode of the Sustainable Connections podcast. I'm Mark Lee. I'm the director of the Sustainability Institute by ERM. The podcast has been designed to bring forward some of the boundary-pushing minds in the field, some of the brave folks, the pioneers, who are doing some of the kinds of collaborating, thinking, partnering, accelerating, scaling that is needed to bring about the kind of economy and world that we all want. We're continuing in our theme of talking to people at organizations in this field who are thinking through the kinds of collaborations and partnerships that are necessary to tackle the biggest sustainability challenges. Today, I have the pleasure of talking to a colleague from JPMC, Rama Varian Kaval. He's the global head of the Center for Carbon Transition, and he's somebody that my colleagues at ERM have had great opportunities to work with over the last couple of years, helping create something called the Carbon Compass. We're going to get into that in the course of our conversation. But first, Rama, I'd really love to hear a bit more about you. I kind of gave the organization and the title, um, but I'd love to hear how you ended up in that role. What were you doing before you took on Global Head of Center for Carbon Transition? And why did you plunge into this role at this stage in your career? Sure, Mark. First of all, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be part of this podcast. Um, uh, I've been at JP Morgan 20 years at this point. And really the only place I've uh, worked since I graduated from from grad school, NYU, which is my last uh, degree. And the Center for Carbon Transition itself is only about two years old at JP Morgan, just just over two years. And um, I took that role on because the topic of decarbonization was becoming quite important, not just to the JP Morgan strategy, but as I was talking to clients, my previous life at JP Morgan, I've always interacted with clients globally across different industrial sectors. Mm -hmm. I could see that this was a topic that was really top of mind for a lot of clients across different sectors, different geographies, and felt like a natural thing for me to kind of migrate to and try to take a stab at. So it's been a pretty interesting, exciting run, I would say, for the last couple of years. And across those 20 years, you were doing other things. You were starting to hear demand from clients for information on carbon. But what exactly were you doing? Where were you in the bank previously? Um, Mostly one job. Um, It's a group called Corporate Finance Advisory that Mm -hmm. uh, the bank actually started in 2005. And uh, I'm a proud kind of founding junior member of that group and grew up with that with that team, um, running that team globally in 2017. And it actually is a very interesting backdrop, I think, and an experience for me to have had to transition to the, the current role. A corporate finance advisory or CFA, what uh, we do there is talk to, again, the same clients, typically corporate clients of JP Morgan Chase, typically the investment bank, but sometimes the commercial bank, on what we would consider broad corporate finance or structural finance issues. So okay. think things like how, how does a company create value by using financial policy choices to make, right? How to capitalize a particular business? How do you think about returning cash back to shareholders? How do you think about uh, the growth strategy or your defense strategy, whatever the case might be, right? And <clears throat> that started uh, morphing into how do I think about my ESG strategy or my decarbonization strategy. Mm -hmm. And so I I did kind of, you know, get into the topic as a corporate finance professional initially. And we're trying to look at the question again as a corporate finance question that uh, we could apply some of the various financial policy toolkit that we had. And then, as I said, morphed into doing this full-time because it just felt like this required uh, a lot more attention. The topic was pretty deep and pretty complex. Yeah. 
Yeah, it is, right? It, it was and it still is. So I, I, I'm so glad I asked that question about your background in that I think it begs a wider question about how the ESG and sustainability approach is structured at JPMC. You know, you've been in the, the Center for Carbon Transition since inception, and you're the global head. And other organizations might have gone out and found somebody who was a lifetime or at least career-long carbon and climate expert. They went to you and brought you from global finance, or you ran from global finance to do this because you wanted to be in this spot. So what's the JPMC structure around you? And and I think it's great news, actually, that essentially the bankers and the finance people are doing the carbon work, but that's not the choice that gets made everywhere. So how did this happen? Yeah, look, I think uh, uh, my from my vantage point, it does feel like different companies, even within the financial sector. But when you zoom out, look at other sectors, uh, everyone's tackling the issues a little differently. For us, we knew from day one that we needed it to be the term we use at JP Morgan a lot is gang tackle, but we needed a bunch of different folks sitting in a bunch of different seats to attack this issue in collaboration. And that's mm -hmm. really what we've been trying to do. Um, we have always had a pretty strong sustainability group within JP Morgan. So corporate function, we've had fantastic experienced professionals there. They kind of, you know, look after, for example, the JP Morgan footprint. Right? And the variety of policies that we, we have adopted over the years, uh, we have had always a very strong risk management focus on the topic of uh, uh, environmental risk or social risks. Right? And those exist. Right? Those are still um, run by very experienced professionals. Mm -hmm. The idea that we had a couple of years back was on top of that, uh, those functions, we needed this topic to be part of the DNA of our bankers felt quite important. Again, the the hypothesis we had then, and I think it's proven out quite effectively so far, is uh, business strategy, sustainability strategy, and finance strategy um, is all coming together for our companies and our clients, right? And so as the CEO or the CFO or the head of business development at these, cli at these clients, they have to make a decision on how to run the company, taking into account all of these different strands, we needed our bankers to be able to talk about all of these things, right? It's very natural for bankers to talk about, you know, business strategy and financial strategy. That's kind of what we grew up talking to our clients. Um, and then kind of the desire to add the sustainability strategy leg to that conversation, we felt was quite important. And mm -hmm. that was kind of the genesis of creating this group within kind of the investment bank and making sure that, again, as I've grown up, uh, as I said, within the firm, you know, within investment banking, uh, surrounded by bankers, talking to clients, it, it was quite natural for me to take this role on and then be really a, a little bit of a catalyst to, to help my peers uh, add this extra, if you will, strand to their toolkit, right? extra tool to their toolkit. And that's kind of, you know, again, as I said, has proved to be uh, quite effective because at the end of the day, as I said, these decisions uh, have to be made in collaboration at our clients, um, at our clients, right? So that's kind of the backstory, if you will. Yeah, no, I'm glad to know where it sits. That was going to be my next question, but knowing that the center remains in the investment bank isn't kind of a separate unit on the sidelines, I think is really important. And, and I liked the the way you stitched together the three elements that this is about combining kind of the legacy or traditional business and strategy elements with the sustainability challenges of the day that have come forward. And that maybe gives us a good pivot. You started to talk about how you're working with clients and Carbon Compass, I think, can fairly be described as part of this. So my understanding, and we'll get you to hone that and, and correct that as much as necessary, is that JPMC set up Carbon Compass to align your portfolio with the ambition of the Paris Agreement. But I think it's one thing to say, we're going to take a lending portfolio and align it, and it's a whole other thing to put that into action. And I know some of breaking it down involved thinking about it sectorally, so it's kind of one sector at a time, or at least discrete strategies for each. But 
would love you to unpick the carbon compass a little bit and tell us how you've started that process of portfolio alignment, because the task is massive. No, it is massive and it is complex. There is no doubt about that. Uh, and you're right. So when we um, initially made the announcement, this was in October of 2020, that we were going to, in fact, Paris align our financing portfolio to the goals of the Paris Climate Accord. And then in May of 2021 is when we actually published uh, Carbon Compass. And what we detailed in that was our strategy and our targets for three sectors, oil and gas, power, and the auto manufacturing sector. Um, we had, as you exactly pointed out, um, distinct targets for each of these sectors and a distinct approach to, uh, to the issue for each of the sector. In fact, for oil and gas, we... Uh, clearly most challenging, right? Uh, I think everyone would agree that well, that is the most challenging sector to think through the decarbonization issue. And uh, that was absolutely the case for us. So we, after a lot of internal work, external partnership with our clients, and of course, the role that ERM itself played, right? Uh, you've been our partner you know, along the way through the last uh, couple of years. What we decided to do was to have two different targets, right? A target for scope one plus two and a separate target for scope three. Mm -hmm. So the, the reason for that, again, being, you know, scope three is clearly quite important and, you know, accounts for the bulk of emissions in the sector. But having said that, a lot of our clients we know are doing a lot of hard work on scopes one and two and putting all of them together to us felt like would be would be not giving the appropriate incentive to our clients who are focused on scope one and two. Right? We definitely didn't want that, you know, our target to become a disincentive rather than an incentive to do more progress, right? So, you know, we made a number of decisions like these along the way, which we felt uh, threaded the needle of ambition and pragmatism, which is what we always wanted to do, right? Have targets which were, really helpful to the overall journey of all of our clients in each of these sectors. And again, you know, by no means are we done. By no means can we claim that uh, we came up with the perfect answer, but we feel pretty proud of the work we have done. Um, again, so May 2021 was when we actually published the targets and the methodology and the year and a half since we have actually spent time putting that into practice, right? Actually Perfect. taking those uh, uh, those targets and using them to make decisions on a transaction by transaction basis so that we are on our way to hit our own ambitions for 2030 and beyond. Yeah, a couple of things you said really resonated for me and a couple of things bred more questions in, in my mind. So the, the phrase you used was something like whether your target's the banks create incentives or disincentives for the clients and and the blend of ambition and pragmatism that you're trying to have. And I just wonder for our, our listeners, could you bring how that's working in practice to life with an example where the ambition and pragmatism have together landed really well and you've been able to work this through with a client or maybe where you got resistance and it took extra effort to convince them? Yeah, look, I think... Um, uh few choices which will kind of make that clear is one, our targets are at the portfolio level, right? For each of the sectors, right? Yeah. Um, and that to me is a pragmatic choice as a global bank servicing clients across the world in different, um, you know, regions facing different challenges, put, putting one marker or one expectation on each of these clients across the globe would have been really not a practical choice to make. And so that was a, you know, one example of where we said, you know, the pragmatic thing for us to do is to aggregate the uh, financed emissions, if you will, at a portfolio level, put a target at the portfolio level and acknowledge the fact that there are certain regions and certain companies which have just made more progress already and have a clearer path to make further progress than others. Uh, in terms of incentive, disincentive, <clears throat> look again, what we don't want to end up doing a choice of carbon intensity to me is another <clears throat> example which which makes that point clearly. Uh, <clears throat> not uh, not an obvious choice by any means, as you know well, and most of our listeners will, right? The debate between absolute emissions and carbon intensity 
mm-hmm. continues to rage on and there are pros and cons to both there is no doubt about that but to us it <clears throat> it felt important to make the uh, the choice of carbon intensity because it gives us an opportunity to go engage with our clients who are providing kind of supplying the need of energy that you know the world demands but to tell them that we would like them to do it as efficiently as possible right there was a pretty big focus if you go read our carbon compass methodology on methane right which is you know a huge problem we focused on it our targets actually you know start ground up and incorporate a really distinct methane uh, methodology which then gets embedded into our overall targets right so uh, we wanted to give clients an incentive to con- you know to improve things that was entirely within their control the global energy demand is something you could argue is not within the control of you know the the clients of jp morgan chase but you know flaring is right leaks are and so yeah. <clears throat> making sure that we give them all the incentives to fix those problems i mean calling them low hanging fruit is probably not doing justice to them each of these problems is complicated but on, on a relative basis there are problems that can be addressed need to be addressed we wanted to <clears throat> give the incentive to our clients to address them and that tells us something about how you've engaged clients and i'll want to talk more about that but it also brings us to the edge of something i think about how the rest of the world has seen this so as an observer of the release of the carbon compass and somebody who watches some of the media and other uh, things that swirl around your organization, part of the skepticism surrounding JPMC is the size of your oil and gas lending portfolio. Oh, I haven't noticed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's big. <laughs> it's the biggest, right? You're, you're the biggest lender to the sector in the world. Um, and so how has carbon compass been received by critical stakeholders? Are they, being convinced by what your ambitions are and are you able to demonstrate to them enough progress that you're winning some folks over because you can demonstrate that the targets are turning into action yeah look again um, i would say that folks who have spent the time trying to understand the philosophy behind carbon compass the philosophy behind our approach and the actions we are taking to operationalize carbon compass i think have for the most part been very supportive of our our, uh, our pathway right okay. the uh, it is absolutely accurate to say that you know we are criticism what i think of as somewhat lazy criticism mm-hmm. that the headline number um, of our fossil fuel financing portfolio is large yep but that's you know as i as i like to say that just simply math our balance sheet is large we are the largest <laughs> bank as you as you started off the, yeah. the introduction right so naturally everything is large when you look at jp morgan chase mm-hmm. um and the other point i make is you know <clears throat> it's inconceivable to me that we can have successful energy transition mm-hmm. without the incumbents participating in it the current suppliers of those megajoules participating in the transition to me that's just not possible so for us to be supporting them and helping them and financing them as they are transitioning seems like an obvious choice to make we know how to bank them right they know how to produce energy and increasingly and this is where we we have a role to play and we do play a role which is to give them the incentive to go a little faster right we are one of many voices that they are hearing about this particular thing that maybe going a little faster is the right thing to do for their own business and for the the global ambition that we have all expressed so we want to do that if we walked away and cut the size of our fossil fuel financing book we lose that ability to actually change a little behavior modulate their behavior right to us that's the role we would like to play seems like that is the more useful role we we could play rather than simply saying i am taking my dollars away and then go find the same dollars somewhere else right um so again it's a clearly a nuanced argument clearly an argument that one can you know one can debate and we debate this with with a variety of stakeholders clients with shareholders with activists right with with a number of folks and we are more than happy to have the debate right we think the choices we have made are practical choices um no means perfect and we were very 
clear right up front that we want to keep thinking about these issues. We want to keep thinking about the metric we have chosen, the choices we have made, the actual numerical target we have put on ourselves, and then improve, right? If, if there is better mm-hmm. information, if somebody else comes up with a better mousetrap that we can learn from, absolutely, we'd love to do that. Yeah, and you'll apply that better mousetrap to that incredibly large portfolio. Exactly. And that, to me, feels like the way in which your portfolio actually is an advantage, that if we're going to decarbonize, that then, then we have to decarbonize the hardest to abate sectors, including oil and gas. And you, you said something in your comments there that's almost verbatim to how I sometimes talk about incumbents. I, I think of the climate crisis as so pressing and so time constrained that I'm not sure we can be successful unless the, the incumbents are part of the solution. I don't know that we can just work around them or, or wish them away. I think we have to work with them as actively as possible to enable their transition. That maybe brings us back from that external response to clients. And by setting a sector-based strategy in your portfolio, has it broader perception maybe with some clients that you are meddling? Like, does this mean you're dictating strategy in any ways to those that you work with? How has this been received? Are people welcoming of your influence? We're calling it incentive, which sounds great, but some folks may see it as something put upon them. Yeah, look, it's entirely possible, some do. And, um, you know, it's maybe unavoidable, candidly. But we take a lot of pride. At the end of the day, we are in the financial services industry, right? We exist to serve our clients, right? That is mm-hmm. at the bottom of it. That's what we do. And everything we go and engage with our clients on, we think is done with the express um, objective of helping them be better at whatever business they run, right? What we provide is an external perspective. Right, I, I don't think anybody at J.P. Morgan will claim that they know how to run an oil and gas business better than our oil and gas clients. Clearly not. But mm-hmm. what we bring to the table is kind of an external perspective, the perspective of how the markets views the industry or a particular company, and how that can be used to inform the client strategy. Right, and the role that sustainability or decarbonization now plays in how markets view certain sectors or certain companies, it's just becoming more and more important. And our job is to go tell them that, that this is where the world we think is going. And given that, we think, JP Morgan thinks, this is the best strategy for you to adopt. And oh, by the way, we are here to help you. And we'll give you our best advice. We'll give you our capital if you want to, if you agree with our, with our advice and you want to go this particular way. And we will, you know, connect you to other capital providers if that's what you want, right? So to mm-hmm. us, we all, we always approach this as a client service matter. Right? We are serving our clients with our best possible advice. Um, it's no different than when I go talk to clients about growth, right? The importance of growth and why if you're a company that's been around for a long time and not really growing, you may want to think about it because the market cares a lot about growth and perceives growth as very attractive. And I might go tell them, here's how we think you could achieve growth. So there is a parallel between that advice and this advice when I go and tell our clients, look, decarbonization is important for a variety of reasons, including from the narrow banker's perspective for markets reasons. And you may want to think about that and you know your strategy for that. And so if this all fits your service proposition, which it has to, um, I, I think that opens up the space to talk not only about climate risk, but about opportunity. So in what ways is Carbon Compass and is taking this approach creating opportunity for the bank that it wouldn't maybe have if it wasn't giving this intelligence and this advice to clients? No, it's massive. I think uh, even three months back, four months back, I would have said this is easily the biggest opportunity for my sector, but for a lot of industrial sectors, right? This this decarbonization trend that is the mega trend that is going to play out over the next many years. Um, and now post the Inflation Reduction Act, I think that just, you know, that is a cherry on the top, right? There is an enormous amount of capital that is being formed around various uh, various markets, public markets, private markets, to 
to address this decarbonization trend. And from the perspective of a bank, you know, our again, our how we make money is to stand, you know, in the intersection of capital flows, right? That is kind yep. of literally how we make money. And so it's a fantastic opportunity for us. But it's 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 also an opportunity for all our clients, right? As as they are thinking about what the future looks like, right? And the, the early movers in every sector uh, will benefit massively, right? And we are seeing that across, I would say, every sector. It's clearly not just an energy-only phenomena. It's happening in every sector, right? Um, so I think of our opportunity set here as there is, we are going to have new clients formed, right? So if I look forward and look at 2030, uh, I'm very optimistic. There'll be a bunch of companies which are not particularly big today or maybe not even exist today who are going to be clients of JP Morgan Chase. Um, these might be hydrogen companies and carbon capture companies and whatnot. So there is that element and we want to be the, the bank of their choice. Be that are, banker, yeah, yeah, their, their banker on right? the other side of the energy transition as well as through it. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. And then, you know, There'll be products, new products developed, right? financial products that we we may be able to innovate, which helps the the bigger picture, the decarbonization trend, but also helps somebody like us uh, provide more value to clients. And when we provide value to clients, then we benefit as well. You mentioned in all of that, Rama, some of the regulatory action that's going on. So uh, specifically, you touched on the Inflation Reduction Act. I was curious to ask you about that and and the impact of the current policy environment on the work that you're doing. Yeah, I'll, I'll draw a distinction between um, things like the IRA, which really catalyze capital flows, and things like disclosure requirements. Uh, I'll start with the IRA. I think, as I said, it is easily the biggest tailwind we have, we have around decarbonization. It's the largest climate bill ever, you know. I think, you know, we've done some math. I know others have done some math. Even though the size of the bill is $350, $360 billion in terms of the climate provisions, this could in total, you know, catalyze closer to $2 trillion of capital around various sectors, right? Whether it's EV or wind or solar or uh, hydrogen or sustainable aviation fuel or whatnot. So massive... um, incentive for anyone who's in the periphery of these sectors to take a very close look and see how they can benefit, right? And we already are seeing that. I would say pretty much every client I've talked to since since August um, in related sectors has thought about at least tweaking their capital expenditure in the future because of the IRA, mm-hmm. right? Because it definitely changes the game. Right? It yeah. creates incentives to make bigger investments in certain areas, et cetera. Pulls forward when some of these emerging technologies can be really commercially viable. It's a total game changer. And so we are very focused on it. Uh, <clears throat> and I think a massive help. And oh, by the way, the knock-on effect of this is lots of other jurisdictions around the world are saying, hey, I don't want to cede my leadership position in this technology or that. And so there might be copycat legislation, I would expect. We've already seen some in Canada. There might be others like, you know, Europe, et cetera, right? So all of that, I think, is uh, is fantastic, right? It just kind of, you know, uh, becomes self-fulfilling, right? Um, so that's all good stuff. The disclosure thing, I'm candidly somewhat on the fence simply because, again, more disclosure is good, no doubt. But I'd love to see some harmonization of okay. that across the board. Uh, I worry that uh, too many different forms of disclosures and requirements around disclosure will create more confusion than be really additive. And, you know, do I want our clients to spend lots of time and resources just disclosing or actually taking action to improve business? If it's a choice, clearly I'd rather take the second one, right? So yes, disclosure would be good. But again, the key for disclosure always was comparability and consistency and i worry that lots of different folks coming out with different schemes might actually you know at the margin hurt more than help yeah and i think well we see some common threads in the disclosure rules that are emerging in different jurisdictions tcfd very notably kind of underpinning a lot of it 
I'm also seeing companies kind of pausing in this moment to wait to see which rules harden. And, and I'm hearing folks talk about that increased burden of disclosure and how much bureaucracy that, that's creating within their organizations and that sometimes it's limiting the scope of their sustainability ambitions because they have to put so much effort into serving this. So maybe this is um, taking us towards an end because we were running out of our time here and we've raised a whole bunch of issues that I'd actually like to have a conversation this long about each of them. But we talked uh, about the critical reaction that some had to the release of the compass. And so I wanna turn that question around and say, let's assume that some of the listeners who might've been doubting are convinced that the, the sheer size of your portfolio and the efforts to move the hard to abate sectors are compelling. And they wanna know what other actors in other sectors can do to help JPMC succeed. What do you wish the rest of the kind of business community or others could offer to guarantee the success of the compass? Yeah, look, I think uh, we always welcome feedback. And one of the early decisions we made was we will put all the gory details, if you will, of our methodology in the public domain. And we have done that um, in the original carbon compass document. We give a bit more details in our ESG report, and we, we plan to continue to do that. And point of that is because we want to invite feedback. So as we were talking about just a few minutes back, if there are better ways to, to solve the issue, right? Better metrics, better targets, better scenarios, we are all here. So welcome feedback. That's absolutely the case. Look, I, I think the, the decarbonization journey has two issues that need to be sorted out. One is a capital issue. One is a credibility issue. As I said, you know, uh, things like IRA are massively helpful to capital formation and a number of financial uh, intermediaries are aligned to provide capital to help clients decarbonize, right? So the capital issue, I think, is making good progress. There is still a bit of a credibility issue mm -hmm. and there is a tendency to take a critical view of, you know, every approach and uh, again, the the... Anything that is not perfect being slammed is, I think, you know, it's, it's, I guess a human tendency that's not particularly useful. But um, I'm not quite sure how we solve the credibility issue here uh, as, a, as a macro matter. But uh, I'm always, as I said, I'm always uh, open to feedback, open to suggestions. And by the way, if you're a company that you, that has a fantastic idea to decarbonize aviation or steel or, you know, aluminum, we welcome those calls as well, right? Those inbounds. And we would love to have a conversation and see how we could help you and uh, how you could help the, you know, the broader economy. You've given us some interesting pairs through the course of the conversation. I'm thinking back to ambition and pragmatism. Now thinking about capital and credibility. On the credibility point, uh, I suspect, of course, that some of the criticism comes from people's genuine and deep-seated concern about the issue, that they're so anxious to see more pro more progress. And, I, I, and yet I agree with you so deeply that there has to be room for experimentation and failure, that if we want bold goals to be set and experimentation to unfold so that we can learn, there will be mistakes and we'll have to you know do things more than once to get them right. And that's the I think folks should challenge uh, goals and progress and ask whether it's enough, but also leave room for people to test and learn along the way. The last question I'd like to ask you, Rama, is a little bit more whimsical than the rest. The name of the podcast is Sustainable Connections. And so we like to ask folks if there's a connection you could make in the field that you think would make a difference. And this might be between institutions. It might be between people. It might be between ideas. You've talked a lot about connecting ideas. Is there an obvious connection that you would be the advocate for? Um, uh, that's an interesting question. Look, I think uh, maybe I'll start with some obvious ones. I think more connectivity between 
public programs, public ambition, public sector, and private capital, mm-hmm. private ambition. Again, it's something that gets talked about a lot, but I haven't seen anything that is really tangible, functional, and needle moving uh, proposed. I know, you know, at COP again, a number of big picture ideas were proposed. I would love for at least some subset of those to get to a point where they're actually making a difference. If you go back to capital and credibility, well, you know who has both? The U.S. federal government definitely has both. There is nothing about does. that, right? So mm-hmm. how do we kind of leverage that? Uh, is something I'd love to see happen. Yeah, I like it. And I always think, you know, some people are so convinced that government is going to be the answer here. And some are so convinced that the private sector is going to be the answer. I just don't see either of them succeeding alone. And in a sense, that's why we're playing up the connections theme. Well, Rama, last thing here is just to say thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate the conversation. Uh, It's been great to work with JPMC over these years. And I know my colleagues have been involved would say the same. And we'll be watching Carbon Compass. We'll be watching as you move it on to other sectors from those initial three. And we'll be really hoping for its success because it's to all of our benefit. So thank you so much. Hope you have a great rest of day. Uh, And in the case that we're talking on a Friday weekend ahead of you as well. Bye for now. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having this conversation. And it's been a pleasure working with ERM over the years. All right. To continue today's Sustainable Connections podcast, Really delighted now to get to welcome Rob LeCount, one of my colleagues. We're based on opposite coasts here in the U.S. Great, Mark. Well, again, thank you. It's great to be with you today. And, uh, you know, I come to ERM, I'm a partner here at ERM, and I come to ERM with a background really on energy and environment. And in recent years, it's really been energy and climate. And in my role at ERM, I'm the regional service lead in North America within our corporate sustainability and climate change practice, our service area. And my particular area focuses, again, on climate change. But when you think about our our broader services, that's working with clients across sustainability and ESG issues, and then also within climate change within that, working from everything in terms of data to strategy to compelling disclosures and doing that across the, the full range of issues. And again, in my role, helping more specifically to support our team uh, in continuing to expand both the team and our services related to climate change advisory. And so I help in a commercial fashion, helping in terms of that regional service, but then also uh, supporting direct projects with clients as well, all related to climate strategy. Well, in my forever inability to resist puns, it sounds kind of like you bring exactly the right energy to the role. Um, but, but all joking aside, uh, especially poor ones like that, Tell me why you came to do this work. You know, it's what you're doing now, but our field is still relatively new. You've been in it for a long time. So how did you get on a climate path? You know, I've, I've spent my, my career and I've had the great opportunities to do this, to really focus on what I most deeply care about, uh, our planet and environmental issues. And when you think about that, there's nothing that has more impact across the globe than our energy use. And so that's been my interest from the very start. And it's really following the issues, right? Uh, I started out working on conventional air pollution, uh, started in uh, the regulatory front in the US at the state and later the federal level, spent time within the power sector, and then quite a bit of my time on energy, economic research and consulting. And really now climate change is defining both from an environmental perspective, but even more importantly, just from a business perspective and and obviously for the, the state of the, um, the planet in terms of the, the urgency that we have in front of us to address climate change. And so it's for me being able to both uh, have an opportunity to have my career to be focused on my passion and having an opportunity to have that impact here at ERM. Ah, oh, that sounds like good fortune for you. And, and I know it's good fortune for us. And like me, Rob, you came into ERM over the last few years through acquisition with an organization called Michael J. Bradley and Associates. Um, we're, we're so lucky to have added that competence to the team and, and to be able to help use that to build up what we can offer in the space. Um, I want to pivot to Rama. And, you know, we've been working with JPMC over the course of a few years, as in the discussion with him at the heart of that, 
has been the work we did to develop the carbon compass with them. You've been part of the team, um, so you know it in detail. And there's the, the carbon compass itself. There's the sectoral approach. I'd love to just hear from you a little bit about how the concept developed, what the challenge was like to bring that to life, and where you think it needs to go next to continue to extend its impact. Well, thanks for that, Mark. You know, it was a, a real pleasure, a great opportunity for us to partner with uh, JP Morgan on the development of the Carbon Compass and truly, a, a, I think, a strong partnership and co-creation in terms of the methodology that was developed. JP Morgan has a strong team. You heard that from Rama. They bring a lot of resources and capability. Uh, so they really have a, a vision in terms of where they wanted to go. I think what a ERM was able to bring to the table is a, a couple key elements. One is a uh, deep understanding of the sectors in which uh, they're focused on for the methodology. And, you know, they came in with a, a strong focus of really wanting to align with the trends and the opportunities on the energy transition within the sectors that we were focusing on. And so in as ERM is, is working with those types of clients within those sectors on their own decarbonization strategies, they're able to bring that, that capability and that expertise, uh, you know, it, bring it into the equation in our work with JP Morgan. A couple of other things that are key elements there is um, one, recognizing, you know, for JP Morgan that it's all around matching the right methodology with their strategy. And so having an understanding of that and, and, and really where they want to go with their support of clients on the energy transition, they had a clear strategy coming in. Then it was our role to help support them in terms of, again, matching a methodology, really creating a methodology that helps to align and to facilitate the strategy that, that, that they have. A couple of key other elements I would say also, one is an understanding, deep understanding of climate scenarios themselves. And so when we talk about being aligned with Paris Agreement, what does that mean? What does that mean by sector? It's not a, a global, you know, even trend that we see. It uh, varies by regions, it varies by sectors. And so bringing that analysis uh, with high objectivity to the, to the table as well. And then finally, a key element is that of data. So we can have all the best ideas here about where things could go and how clients might transition. But um, in the end, we also need good data to understand that, to inform both uh, JP Morgan and their strategy, but again, how they most effectively uh, engage with their clients and other stakeholders, I would say, as well. Great summary, I think, Rob. Really clear and nice to have it broken down into the parts. I'm curious to add to that. You've been doing this work for a long time, following both your passion and your purpose in doing it. I'm willing to bet you've probably worked with more deep climate experts than banking and finance experts. And we talked about that in the conversation with Rama, that their team is a bit unique because it's a bunch of guys who came from the, the commercial side of the business who are now running the Center for um, Climate Transition. And did you experience that as different than maybe some of the other folks you've worked with at different institutions over time? Climate strategy is really business strategy. And so every organization is, is structured a bit differently. But in the end, what that means is, yes, we're working in some cases with some climate experts, but mostly we're working with leadership within those organizations across many facets of a company. And I would say that, you know, today we might say that there are few and fewer or a few uh, climate experts, but over time, uh, we'll all become more climate experts because that's going to be really the integration of these key issues within overall uh, business strategy. You've talked about decarbonizing finance, specific challenges of working through the sectors they influence. If I broaden that a bit further and say, where do you think we are on the path to 2030 and hitting the targets that we must to, to deliver on climate progress. Um, what are you looking for in 2023 to ensure that we build or keep enough momentum? A couple of things come to mind. Uh, one is when we are focused on working with companies on strategy or even looking at the interface of, of policy. We, uh, with Rama, you talked uh, about the important development of the Inflation Reduction Act as, a, as an example. Um, that focus on new investment and strategy is also highlighting the need for data, better data to inform decisions. Here we have a lot of capital flow looking for low carbon. How do we have the right data to inform that? We have now 
more buyers asking for that information from their suppliers. We have investors asking for that as they look at the pro forma for a new investment on clean energy. What's the benefit? What does this provide me? What is the reduction in carbon that I'm achieving with that? And so that's not a new element uh, that's been uh, developing for some time, but I'd say the stakes are higher as we have capital flow beginning to increase on this, as we have more uh, momentum and excitement around investment, it puts more focus on having the right data to inform those decisions. So that's number one. And that's both in terms of the, the private sector, in terms of the work that's being done, but also government. So that's a part of the Inflation Reduction Act. And in terms of how to support some of the policies that and, and the implementing regulations. Number two is that, again, kind of back to this point about moving from measurement and um, commitments to now implementation. Uh, we're working with many companies that are going for forward with their next round of investments. Inflation Reduction Act, in many cases, are even pulling some of those investments forward compared to where they were previously within the business plan, but it's going forward with those actions. And so that's an exciting place to be in, but it's also a challenging place to be as, as organizations are making those investment decisions. But we're on the cusp of that. We have a lot of that activity that's happening right now uh, across North America and more to come. And so I'm excited and optimistic about that level of investment that we see uh, happening today. Really glad to close on a note of optimism. I would say actually both things, your number one and your number two that you mapped as objectives or hopes for 2023. You've hooked me. Uh, I want to see them as well. Really appreciate you joining me, Rob, today to kind of debrief and reflect a bit on the relationship and the conversation with Rama. Uh, would love to have you back another time, perhaps to talk more about decarbonizing finance, maybe to explore your work in other sectors. But for now, just thank you so much and um, uh, appreciate both the time and the insight. Thanks for the opportunity, Mark. Great to be with you. To keep connecting and learn more about how ERM is shaping a sustainable future with the world's leading organizations, visit ERM.com and subscribe to the show on your platform of choice. To learn more about the Sustainability Institute, visit sustainability.com and be sure to join us for our next episode.